Thank you so much for that reading of scripture. Clyde was a man who was due to inherit a furniture factory when his sickly father died away, passed on. Oh, wow, he was going to be a rich man. What a great inheritance that was coming his way. And thinking of this vast fortune and what he was going to do with it, he thought, you know, I really wish I could share it with someone in my life. I think I'm going to find a, a wonderful woman to share it with. So he went out to a wonderful cafe and sat there for a while and he looked across those who were coming in to, to get a cup of coffee and sit. And re oh, there was a gorgeous woman and he walked up to her and simply said to her, I'm only an ordinary man. But in a week or two, my father will die and I'll inherit a $20 million business. Hmm, thought the woman. Wow. And his, at his invitation, she went home with him. And the next day, she, he, she became his stepmother. <laughs> You'll get it. She figured out how to inherit everything. She figured out how to get access to everything. Not having to wait a bit or to share it. She got it all. How about you? Are you ready to receive it all or to know that you are an heir and that all that is of God is yours? Are you ready to receive that? Are you at that place in life that you figured out that you are entitled to it all? You really are. For the scripture today unfolds this great truth for our lives. Yes, you are an heir. And I want you to turn to the person next to you and simply say, congratulations, you're an heir. <laughs> wow, we've got a room full of heirs. How wonderful. Room full of people who are blessed and receiving great things of God that are there for us. This is what it really is as today's text unfolds for us this spiritual truth that you are an heir of God. To be an heir really means that you are that son or daughter of God, no matter who you are. Now we say, wait a minute, we're all so diverse and so unique in this world. Yes, each and every one a child of God, each and every one of us. And we wonder when we really embrace that is entitled to all that is of God. To the entitled means to the wonderful essence, to the, shall we say, the property or state of God. Just as an heir or a, of a relative or a friend comes into possession of the property that's bequeathed to them. Jesus spoke of this relationship of God and man. And uh, speaking truly in this text is calling God the Father, the source. Truly explaining it that the source is that saying that we all come from this same place of the divineness. And he spoke declaring that we should be in consciousness and awareness of this wonderful oneness. You, you, me, we're all one. We're all in this together, all children of God, all in our own uniqueness, entitled to the great blessings that are there of God. John chapter 10, verse 30 says, Jesus proclaimed, I am the Father, I am the divine source. We're truly one. He writes and says and shares the glory, the power, the understanding, or the revelation that we are one, that you have given me, O God, and I have given them that they may be one is truly a lie. This is the essence that Jesus was trying to bring about for everyone. That that which you've uh, unfolded within me, I'm trying to unfold with them. I'm trying to teach, share, enlighten, let everybody know to get this over and over again. Because one of the things you're going to note about when you study Bible, the Bible, you're going to see how many times Scripture repeats certain themes over and over again. Why? Because it's that repetition that enables us to grasp it. The more we hear something, the more we're fully aware, the more we own it. You went to school, you didn't learn all of the uh, arithmetic at one time, you didn't grasp it all at one time. Why is it that you've, got, you've uh, passed from third grade to fourth grade and the teacher's got to review everything from third grade before we can get started again? Well, it's that review that constantly brings it to our attention, to our awareness, helps us understand it. What we're discovering is that throughout the scripture, these very themes are echoing over and over again for us to help us grasp them. This wonderful truth that we might understand you and I are in this oneness. 
how beautiful in Linda's prayer today. Thank you so much. I didn't even know you were going to say this, but uh, the essence of that namaste spirit, that we see the God in us sees the God in you, and how powerful. When we get that, we don't need to explain all these other issues of sexual orientation, gender nonconformity, uh, issues of our differences, our uniqueness, because what we're really seeing is the uniqueness is truly the divine expression. And each and every one of us are that divine expression of God. When we get that, wow, it all falls into place. Jesus taught it over and over again, talking about this wonderful awareness that when you get this, you understand. And you understand all that is of God. Jesus spoke of this in such a way, pro proclaiming an intimacy. In using those words of Abba, that intimacy of a, sort of a, a close and divine relationship with the very source and the essence that is all of God. When we all embrace that Abba, that Father, that divine spirit within us, when we embrace that in such a way that we see that we're all from the same place, the same source, all coming from the spirit, all of those differences that we may want to cite in this world fall away, and all we see and experience is our commonality. Here's what we need to understand. Echoed over and over again from the very beginning, from Genesis and the very start of the Bible, we find that we are made in the likeness and image of God. In Genesis chapter 2, let us make humankind in our image, the scripture says, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind. In God's image, in the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Wow, we're all created, male or female, in that very likeness of God. Now that likeness we know is not a physical likeness. We know that that's not a physical element, but a spiritual likeness. For God is not a phys physical being confined to any one location. We say it over and over again. There is not a spot where God is not, right? There is not a spot where God is not. So we can't confine God to one location or to one being, to one essence, to one spot. For God tonight or today, right now, is moving around the world. The wonderful essence of that spirit and presence is alive all around the world. There is no one place in this universe that God is confined to. For God is not a physical being, but that spiritual essence and power that is experienced all throughout the universe. So we understand then that the image that we're made in is the image of power, the image of might, of wisdom, of wholeness. We're created in the image of understanding and of truth, of light and of love. Wow, that's what you look like. Turn around and take a look at one another. What do you see? But you can see with those spiritual eyes, light, love, wisdom. We can see the unfolding of that which is of God in power and might and wholeness. And it's all around us. In 1 John 1, 5, there's a beautiful passage that says this. This is the message and announce to you that God is light. And in God, there is no darkness at all. Wow. We're made in this image. And what is that image? Light. And in that image, there is no darkness. We find without scripture that, throughout Scripture that the term darkness is truly a reference for that which is ignorance or that which may be a uh, lack of understanding. What happens when we walk in darkness, when the lights are out? What are we doing? We're walking in that space where we can't see, right? We may stumble. We may falter. We may find ourselves fearful or limited because we just can't see what's ahead. We're in this darkness. Scripture says, if we say that we have fellowship with God, or that we say that we're one with God, and yet we still walk in darkness, we walk in this lack of understanding, we walk in this ignorance, then it says we lie. And we do not practice the truth. We do not practice the truth. If you're walking in darkness and you say, wait a minute, that which I am is the light, I should be able to then welcome the infinite wisdom of God, to know that God is at work at all times, to know that that which is in me and part of me is manifesting something wonderful. Wow, that's the light. But if we profess something other than that, we really profess 
our limitation, that we're standing in darkness, we're standing in an inability to comprehend or a lack of consciousness of what it is. But when we do step into light, we then suddenly understand that what we're practicing is this wonderful principle that we know, we understand. All that is of God is ours. And we begin to practice it every day. We begin to say, I know that in my limitations, in my own mind, I may see limitations. But in the mind of God, there are no limitations. I am in the image of the divine. So I can think of possibilities. Solutions are mine. You know that old adage, the problem is we think there's a problem. And that's the beginning of the whole situation. We think there's problems constantly, but when we embrace instead this wonderful understanding, the mind of Christ is mine. There's not problems. Infinite solutions are mine. Wow, life takes on a totally new dynamic for our lives. So this is what it means to be one with God. Infinite power, infinite wisdom, infinite possibilities. They're all there for us. And the light is that powerful understanding that's gone on of illumination to go, Wow, I understand. Darkness is no more, but we're totally living in the light. That's what it means to be in God. God is light. Wow, think about your name, the name you just chose. You voted to call yourself City of Light. Think about what that just means. You're a wonderful city of God, then, you might say. Or a city of truth, you might say. A city of understanding. Wow. City of oneness. A city of unity. How about the city of realizing we are heirs and we know who we are? Wow. That's pretty powerful. What a great name. City of we realize we're heirs and we know who we are. You see, all through this scripture is the unfolding of stories of people who I forgot. I forgot. I simply forgot who I am. I forgot that I'm the child of God. I forgot that I'm an heir. I forgot that all these things are possible. I forgot that the dynamics of that which is of God is fully allowed within me to be expressed at any moment, at any time. I simply forgot. And so it is that when we understand that we are city of light, we're city of people, a metropolitan community, a collective, a body that realizes we're heirs. We honestly know who we are. What a difference it makes when we come to that place. When we understand that. For our original state is to be one with God. We were created in that image, birth of God, to walk each and every day in that essence and understanding. And yet sometimes we forget and we walk away. We come to this place where we've sort of wandered into our own ignorance, the darkness in the world. And so it is that we must be awakened to this truth over and over again, reminded constantly to be the demonstration of God. You know how it is when you see a kid and you uh, look at that child and you think, wow, that child's so much like their father. Oh, so much like their mother. How about it that when they looked at us, they would say, you're so much like the source. You're so much like the divine. You're so much like that which is all of God. How powerful that is. For that is our calling, to live that out every single day. That the world may say, wow, I see in you the divine. I see that you're so connected. There's such a sense of oneness, such an awareness of that, that all that radiates from you is that truth. You are the light of the world. You are embodying that understanding. We can say to ourselves then, that scripture text went on to say, that you are no longer a bond servant but a son or a daughter. And if a son or a daughter, then you are an heir. The very text, the very principle for us to understand is that you are entitled to all the goodness of God. And this is the great expectation, that those who are fully enlightened and aware would walk in that kind of way that says, I am going in to possess the land. That's why we have these beautiful stories in the Old Testament of the children of Israel wandering through wilderness, going in to do what? Possess the land. For their story is our story. And when we find that as they came to this place, many times they wandered in ignorance. They moved into the fields of darkness as they forgot who they were. Constantly had to be reminded over and over again, just like you and I. And so it is that as they came to that place, they realized, wow, we're the sons of and daughters of God entitled to go and possess the land. Go and to claim that which is the goodness of God, that 
That is ours. That is our. Do you know that as they came through the wilderness, the promised land was on the other side, and what separated them? The river of Jordan. The rivers are symbolic of our consciousness and our thought throughout all through Scripture. Anytime there's water, it's a wonderful symbolism for us of our consciousness. What it took for them is to cross over to the promised land, cross over one river, one thought. That's all it took for them to possess the land. All it takes for you to move from saying, oh, from lack to blessing, from saying, I have none, to knowing that I'm an heir. All it takes for you is just simply one thought to change your mind, to embrace that, and you cross over into this wonderful promised land of possessing and claiming and knowing that all things are good and they are there for you. And that's God's intention. For Jesus spoke of an abundant life, that that might be that which you live out each and every day. We find that this text is then inviting us to realize you're no longer this bondservant. Because as we look in the Greek and actually into the Hebrew, we find that it describes it this way. One who is subservient and who is entirely at the disposal of his master or one who is unworthy. Whoa. Now there's a big one for us. Unworthy. How many times does this come up in our conversation in the journey of our Christianity is our belief that we are unworthy. For our very fear of going in to possess, to claim that which is the goodness of God, it echoes simply that we still are grounded in a, some crazy belief system that we think we're unworthy. The only reason we think we're unworthy is someone's convinced you that you're not the heir, that you're not the child of God, that you are something other than. The only reason that we embrace any kind of unworthy is simply we forgot. We forgot who we are. We forget that we are the heir. And so it's a calling for us to say, get comfortable with your worthiness. Get comfortable with it. Ooh, shake it around a little bit. You know, because a lot of times we're just like, I, I don't know if I'm really comfortable saying I'm worthy. I'm worthy of God's best. Am I really comfortable saying that, I, you know, I can actually claim these things or that I deserve these things? Well, let's just go back again. And what does the scripture say? Who made you? God. How were you made? In the image and likeness. Perfect. Fully worthy. Did God then remake you into something unworthy? No. Well, what lessons are being repeated over and over again through the scripture? This one. That we need to remember who we are. What did Jesus pray that we would understand as we read through John chapter 17? That we should be one. One with God, one with this likeness and image, one with this awareness. Oh, we're an heir. Yet we struggle with being comfortable with that. We struggle with this and we still want to feel like and somehow we are unworthy. We are people who call to possess the land to go after it. That should be your day-to-day -day intention. I wake up and go, I'm out to possess the land. Now that's a different attitude, isn't it? You woke up in the morning and you think, I'm only out to possess a cup of coffee. That's the limitations that you may start out with. How about if we go beyond that and say, I'm out to possess. I'm out to receive. I'm out to go after all the goodness of God that is, well, it's already there. So the going after is not going out to seek, but simply an awakening, an acknowledgement. It's here. It's present. It's always been waiting for you. We get the idea that somehow that God's goodness is something that's going to come after we begged or pleaded or manifested in some way that we just said, uh, it's going to come around to us one day. It's already there. It's already been waiting for you all along, waiting for you to awaken, to step out of that ignorance and darkness, to wait, step into the light and realize that that which is of God is yours. For each of us is an heir of God, whether we're aware of it or not. You know that? Whether you're aware of it or not, you're still an heir. You're an heir. You're an heir. We're all entitled to the wonderful blessings of God. There is no partiality. In Scripture, it says over and over again, there is no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female. It goes on and on to say, in God, God knows no distinction. So the blessings are there for you and you and you all the same. 
Now we get into these groups of people who may want to talk about the goodness of God. They get up and share a testimony. And you know how someone says, oh, God has blessed me and great things are happening and miracles are unfolding for me and they tell the wonderful stories and everybody's listening and after a while I'll go, well, that ain't happening for me. It may work for you, but that'll never happen for me. And suddenly we get, rise up and get kind of jealous and who did they think they are? Talking about the goodness of God, like God's blessing them. Are they someone special? You know, we begin to jealousy rises up and uncomfortability rises up and we begin to think, well, they must be thinking they're all that. What's really going on in our lives? But suddenly is that feeling that we just don't believe that that goodness is there for us. And so we speak only from our own personal lack rather than a full understanding that these things of God are there for each and every one of us equally. And if it happens for you, it happens for me. If it's happening for you, it's happening for me. And if it's happening for me, it's also going to happen for you as you claim it as you claim it, as you acknowledge it, as you awaken to it. For God is not a respecter of persons. So when you hear someone saying, hallelujah, I've been blessed, you shout up, I'm going to be blessed too. Because you know what? If it's happening for you, it's going to happen for me. And you know what? If something good is happening for someone else, while well, it's just a testimony and affirmation that something good is possible for you the same. So we begin to welcome that over and over again. We can claim only as much as we become conscious of. Only as much as we become conscious of. Now, wow, there's unlimited possibilities, but a lot of us hold back in a sense of consciousness. Or we can claim to the degree, to the degree. Now, that's kind of an unfamiliar phrase for a lot of us that we think, wait a minute, to the degree, what do you mean? You know how it is on the furnace? The thermostat that you've got on your wall, you turn that up a little, a few more degrees, and suddenly it gets a little warmer in the room, you know? It's that kind of idea that as we turn it up to the degree, as we turn up our intention and our consciousness and the intensity of our desire, suddenly we're turning it up that, wow, we're open to even more of the things of God. Remember, you set your own limitations. It's like the thermostat on the wall. You set it to a comfortable level? Have you just gotten comfortable with it being just a little chilly and a little cold? How about we turn it up a degree? Turn it up a few notches. Turn up the intensity of your expectation. And we awaken then that consciousness. We awaken it. And here it is, story after story, once again repeated, about an awakening us to say, raise that level of awareness. Raise that a degree of consciousness and intensity in your life. The beautiful story of Moses, who fled from Egypt, fled from the Egyptian palaces of the pharaohs, running to, into the wilderness to live there and marry and be a shepherd. And one day, a burning bush before him begins to call him out. A burning bush, a bush that seems not to be consumed, but in that moment there is that awareness that he is now on holy ground. And the voice seems to speak to him in a way that symbolically says, you got to take off your sandals. What? You got to take off your sandals. Yes. Remove that, that you may be on holy ground. Let me tell you this. In the journey of our life, sometimes we got some sandals on that need to come off. What does that mean? It means that we're not fully aware that where you're standing right here and now, this very presence, is holy ground. You are in the presence of the divine, and it is always there. Every step you take is holy ground. Every space you go. You, know, you don't have to run off to a, to a special sacred uh, position or place to find somehow a, a greater awareness of God. You're at holy ground anywhere you are. But what's keeping you from that understanding and that awareness is symbolic of those sandals, that barrier between your feet, your consciousness, and awareness that you are grounded in a holy place, and all that is of divine. And so it is that voice says to Moses, remove your sandals. Get aware that those bare feet, get those toes deep into the sand, get into the consciousness and awareness that you are now in a holy space, and that's where you stand not only now, but every day. And when we've come to that place that we realize that every day, every moment, we are standing on holy ground, 
it changes everything in our lives. Holy ground is the ground of God's wonderful provision and blessing. Holy ground is that which where you are welcome to receive that inheritance fully and with great liberation. We understand that over and over again, and yet the stories don't stop there. Do you ever notice how many references there are to removing your sandals? What was the great teaching of Jesus? For as the disciples gathered together, there was a gathering of them and no one seemed to want to be prepared to wash the feet of one another. You see in that, e that Eastern culture, journeying all day, stinky feet and sandals and dirt and dust, coming into the house, it was a tradition then that someone be there to wash the feet of someone else. And here it is that Jesus steps up and looses the sandals of each one and washes their feet. He's removing those barriers, removing those limitations. That's what those sandals seem to speak of. For as that desert bush began to speak out, get rid of those sandals, get rid of those limitations, so that you might really understand you're on holy ground. Jesus, in his powerful teaching, teaches us every single day. I am removing your sandals, helping you to understand that you are on holy ground. And as I wash your feet, I wash and cleanse this with an awakening, a new consciousness and an awareness of who you are. You are the divine. You are the child of God. You are an heir. And the scripture says, in another reference, beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. I always thought that, well, what do you mean? Those who preach have got beautiful feet? I don't think so. I don't think so. I've seen some pretty ugly feet on some pastors and leaders and teachers. That's not what it means at all in the physical. It means beautiful are the feet is the, those who have removed those barriers are now awakened that there are no limitations. Beautiful is that, for they walk then teaching this powerful message. It's so beautiful that they preach the good news, and the good news is that you are an heir, that blessings are there for you, that goodness is there for you. It's all according to your degree, according to the level of your consciousness, according to your willingness to desire that which is there for you. And when we apply, that awareness, when we apply those energies and right thinking and feeling, when we apply that all to God, we suddenly prepare our consciousness to receive something wonderful in our lives. There is an inner re realization of God's wonderful divine blessing for us. And suddenly our whole outlook changes. For we continue to be an heir of God even though at times when we seem to be slaves of circumstances. Ooh. Now, you're still an heir, but do you know how it is? Sometimes in life, we lose sight and we slip those sandals back on, you might say. We still got those limitations and we become slaves to the circumstances around us. We look at the world around us and we're constantly saying, oh, wait a minute, all I see is limitation, Pastor. How can you dare say to me that I'm an heir? I'm not receiving anything. I'm not blessed. I'm struggling. I'm having financial challenges. I may have lost my job. You don't know all the difficulties I'm facing. You don't know how hard it is for me to go through this every single day. And now you're preaching that we're blessed and we can claim all. Oh, yes. You see how sometimes we become a slave to the circumstances. It is that we have uh, somehow embraced the circumstances as those to be our true reality rather than understanding as spiritual people, children of God. There's a new reality for each and every one of us. Demonstrated again, echoed over and over and repeated once again is the very theme of this found in the story of the walls of Jericho. As the children of Israel came to this walled city and wanted to possess it, it seemed like there was such an obstacle they became a slave to the circumstances, thinking it's not going to happen. But instead, they took off their sandals. In other words, they changed their thinking. They began to re-view the circumstances in a new way. And they began to march around them. March around. Walk. Holy ground. Claiming. Proclaiming. And suddenly what happens? The walls fall down. And the barriers are removed in their life. 
How wonderful it is then when we see that, that you need not be a slave to the circumstances, but march around on this holy ground claiming and knowing that that which is of God is also yours. You're an heir. When we realize that we are heirs of God, and that the dominion and mastery simply lie within ourselves, then we're truly free from those old thoughts and those conditions that may say, wait a minute, this is what the world is speaking, this is what's all around me, this is what I'm facing on a day-to-day -day basis. No, no, no. Through the eyes of God, I see walls falling down. I see the world in a whole new way, and we become free to accept our true inheritance from God. The birthright that is ours, the blessing of each and every person that is there for us. I'm here today to tell you, congratulations, you're an heir. Are you ready to receive? It's yours. Amen.